We have built a lot of gaming focused systems in our time and a gaming PC can act as a very competent video editing workstation. But here's the thing. If you don't care about gaming, there are ways that you can change your configuration to both save money and improve performance. And thanks to ViewSonic sponsoring this video and sending over one of their VP2785 4K professional displays, we are going to be doing it in style. Let's set aside our display for now though and talk instead about what you're going to be viewing on it. If you're a content creator these days, chances are you're not only shooting or capturing in 4K, but you're editing in 4K too, and for good reason. Many productions master their content at much higher resolutions than the intended delivery format because more resolution provides a number of benefits, including extra versatility for VFX and the ability to reframe a shot in post without losing a significant amount of quality. Uh, hey editor, actually, can you show them how far you can zoom in on me thanks to our 8K camera? Pretty cool, right? Furthermore, a higher resolution original source, let's say uh, one that's at 5K or 6K, reduces certain types of visual artifacts and results in a greater amount of detail when the video is eventually downscaled and compressed to be cheaply delivered over the internet, like on Netflix or YouTube. That's a basic rule of compression, garbage in, garbage out, and vice versa. Anyone can benefit from high resolution footage if they've got the hardware to work with it. But what exactly does that mean? I mean, if you wanna get technical about it, just about any modern computer can edit 4K video, so long as you've got enough patience. But if it's a smooth experience you're after, then depending on the types of formats that you shoot in and the types of effects you want to apply, then the hardware choices start to matter a great deal. And since smooth is kind of subjective, it gets really challenging to choose the right parts for a budget rig. Fortunately, we've got you guys. If you work with a lot of H.264 encoded media, then chances are that you'll wanna take advantage of Intel's UHD graphics for better performance. But since our goal was to build an all-rounder machine that can handle a mix of formats comfortably, we've turned to Team Red with the Ryzen 5 3600. This six core 12 thread processor is a great value. And as you can see from Puget Systems' excellent article on the subject, it even trades blows with Team Blue's eight core processors in some professional workloads, thanks to Zen's architectural advantages in CPU encoding and decoding. If you read their methodology though, you'll probably notice that they used DDR4-2666 for testing. Not only is 3200 megahertz RAM usually just as cheap, third gen Ryzen absolutely loves fast RAM. So after some load testing with our sample 4K footage, we've settled on 16 gigs of 3200 megahertz memory as our baseline. Now, obviously, if you work with very complex timelines, 16 gigs may not be enough for you. So in that case, you should grab a 32 gig kit or even more. As an added bonus, you can usually get 3600 megahertz for about the same price as 3200 megahertz at these capacities, which should give you a small performance boost. Now, some of you may not actually like our choice of motherboard, but at the time of writing, availability is pretty poor for B450 chipset motherboards that have the combination of features, VRM capacity, and the out of the box support for third gen Ryzen that we're after without needing AMD's BIOS upgrade kit. So we went with the B450A Pro from MSI at $95. Now once factory updated B450 boards are commonplace or a 500 series B chipset comes along, you might be able to save a further $20 or so if you play your cards right. Speaking of which, our graphics card. Sadly for Team Red, Nvidia pulls off a pretty healthy lead in both the Adobe Suite and in DaVinci Resolve. And while you don't need a high-end graphics card for just straight video editing, when it comes to GPU accelerated encoding, which you can do with third-party media encoder plugins, or real-time application of effects like Lumetri Color, VR denoising, optical flow, and especially After Effects MoGarts, you will definitely want a dedicated graphics processor of some kind in your system. 
even if you were running on Team Blue. After some experimentation, we determined that the GPU load wasn't particularly high on our RTX 2060, which had been our first choice, so we eventually settled on the NVIDIA GTX 1650. It will not handle 8K RED footage at full resolution like the 2060 will, but the thing is, that's not what we're here for today, so in it goes. Now let's talk storage. If we really needed to save a buck, we would start with a reasonably priced boot drive SSD like this NVMe 500 gig Samsung 970 Evo. This will keep your operating system feeling nice and snappy while also acting as a scratch disk for render effects, nested clips, and proxies. Then for our bulk footage, we'd go with, sorry, hard drive packaging sucks. Well, a pair of high capacity commodity hard drives that would come in a little piece of plastic like this. We went with a couple of Seagate NAS drives. Now, the size of the drives you choose really depends on how many projects you expect to have on the go at a time. But here are some general guidelines that we've put together for you for how much storage you can expect your footage to take up. Now, in a perfect world, guys, we would store our raw footage on an external drive of some sort. In fact, we've got a second installment in the series planned where we're gonna build a safe, affordable external network storage box. So make sure you're subscribed for that. Finally, there's the case and power supply. Even though we aren't likely to be thermally constrained with these kinds of specs, we're not looking for the bottom of the barrel here either. So Fractal's Focus G is today's case choice. It looks professional enough that you could bring a client around without it being embarrassing, and it's got decent ergonomics for when you're building and decent airflow without breaking the bank. Other options here include the Cougar MX330 and the Fantex P300, the latter of which includes a tempered glass side panel if you'd like a little bit more of that aesthetic in your life. For our power supply, we're playing it safe with Corsair CXM 2015 edition. It's 80 plus bronze, modular, and is often on sale with good overall performance for its price. It is worth noting that if you wanted something a little better and potentially more reliable, for an extra $30, you can grab the FSP Hydro PTM that's rated in the ultra high end in the PSU tier list that's hosted on our forums. And then if you wanted to save $20 for a shirt from lttstore.com, you could also drop down to a non-modular 450 watt Corsair CX 2017. And that's it. That makes for a total system cost of just over $925 for a setup that can do real work and that you can even get paid with. Of course, we still need to actually demonstrate all of that. So let's get this thing fired up and see how it runs. We'll be using Windows' built-in software RAID 1 mirroring in order to ensure that in the event of a physical drive failure, we won't lose any of our project data. But there are a couple of things about this solution that I want to emphasize. One, I cannot condone storing anything important on a single mechanical drive. No matter how tight your budget is, you must have anything important in at least two places. And number two, RAID is not a backup. In the event of a ransomware infection, accidental deletion, natural disaster that physically affects your computer, or software corruption, that second drive could end up being exactly as compromised as the first one and not do anything for you. So this is our bare minimum recommendation that also assumes that you will be very careful with your setup. Okay then, so with all of that out of the way, um, Dennis, do you wanna come in and try out our amazing budget editing setup? Yes. So this is some footage shot on the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, uh, stay, stay on the purple one, yeah. uh, of Brandon's dog. Basically, I just want you to tell me about the experience. Like, does it meet your expectations for working with this 4K footage? Okay, I'm playing full right now. Yeah. Scrubbing through, pretty good. Oh, oh my God. Wow, Brandon, your dog got fat, dude. So we've got real-time color, oh, oh, we've dog. applied some effects, and we're still not dropping any frames, even though we're playing back in full quality. Okay, now you're dropping frames. What did you do to my, oh, just what did you do fast, to my computer? Fast forward. Oh, okay, so now we're good. So now to push things, we're firing up that same clip in After Effects, and we're... We're adding some wiggle to make the camera like more dramatic and gonna put some fire particle. No one wants to watch The Born Identity starring Brandon's dog. Oh look, we're playing full. Still, it's playing pretty fast. Now she's in the middle of like a fire tornado and earthquake at the same time. Oh. Wow, so After Effects is sucking back about 40% of our CPU. 
We are still pretty comfortable in terms of memory usage though, even with Premiere open in the background. So, so far, what would you say of the editing experience on our machine here? To be honest, like Particle World usually take a lot of um, RAM and yeah. the, the, a lot of power. So far, when I play back in full, still pretty good. So that's great then. So far, our budget 4K editing station is keeping up surprisingly well, but I think we can push it further. So while Dennis is playing around with some 8K red footage over there, I'm gonna tell you guys about the ViewSonic Color Pro monitor that we're using here. So it features 99% coverage of the Adobe RGB color gamut, which is about 96% of DCI-P3, so it's great for video editing. Every unit gets its own calibration report and is tested at the factory for a delta E of less than two, which should be indiscernible from completely accurate colors. ViewSonic works with X-Rite and Pantone to generate its internal color library, which references a 14-bit 3D lookup table of about 4.39 trillion colors. And their Color Pro monitors can use the X-Rite i1 Display Pro Calibrator to access the ViewSonic's internal color library, which is better than using third-party calibration tools, which can only do software calibration. It's got USB 3.1 for a single cable connection that can charge your laptop at the same time, along with a USB Type-A hub, so you can plug all your peripherals in through your monitor. And the three-sided frameless design means less distraction while you're trying to focus on your work. Speaking of focusing on your work, Dennis, how's this going? Oh, I'm putting a lot What are you doing to it? It's not even recognizable. You see? Pushing really hard. Might want to play it at uh, one Quart quarter. Yeah. So you would consider this to be like meets expectations for the amount of effects that you're applying here? Yeah, because I actually put quite a lot to generate uh, effect because this effect is pretty heavy. So if I just want effect. Oh, then that's easy. That's real glitching. time playback. This is playback. A, a glitching effect? <laughs> yeah, it's glitching effect. <laughs> it's not real. Now we want turbulent displays. Real time playback still. Not bad. So to be clear, we were running at one quarter preview quality there, but that was at 8K footage, which as you guys might remember, is four times the pixel count of 4K. So can we dial it back now and do something a little bit more reasonable? Okay, so we like have- A7S II. We have A7S II 4K footage here. So what Dennis is doing right here is a perfect example of why even if you're gonna deliver finished 1080p footage for web consumption, it's still great to shoot in 4K because you can see he can punch in and sort of reposition the frame however he sees fit. So playback of our A7S II footage, even at full quality is fine, but our timeline scrubbing performance is not the greatest, even at half quality. So we wanna have a look and see uh, how our other footage responds. So we've gone ahead and loaded up a timeline with all our different 4K footage now. So the blue one is A7S. Yeah. The purple one is that's Black Magic. Black Magic. Uh, uh, green one is C200. So it's... all of them are actually better than the A7S, yeah. and this is all at full quality. Yeah. This is Black Magic. 4K. Pretty good. Yeah, that's really good actually. C200. Pretty good. That's actually very usable. So we've done pretty well so far, handling anything from 4K, even all the way up to 8K footage in a variety of formats. But with how popular Sony's mirrorless cameras are, anything that can't comfortably handle footage coming off of them can't really be called uh, a viable, anything goes 4K editing solution. That is why we mentioned earlier that we wouldn't go any lower than the processor that we chose with its six cores and eight threads. So what I'm doing in the background is actually something that used to be a part of our workflow here at Linus Media Group back when we would shoot on our A7S IIs quite frequently. So I'm converting the MP4s that come straight out of the camera to Cineform YUV 10-bit. And what we're gonna find out when we go ahead and throw these clips on our timeline is that they're gonna perform quite a bit better. I'm just gonna junk this last one and then we'll throw the rest of them on. Now, this process does add a little bit of time to your workflow, but the good news is that from our experience, it has a negligible effect on the image quality. And as you can see, it is a much, much smoother editing experience. So because of software or codec limitations, there's never gonna be a single machine, no matter how high end you go, that's gonna work for every workflow. But by building something balanced or a little bit stronger than you absolutely need in certain areas, you can make up for other deficiencies and make sure that you're getting your projects done on time and on budget. <laughs> on the subject of getting video production done on a budget, it used to be that the monitor to go with your workstation that costs you thousands and thousands of dollars 
also cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, but it's become much more accessible. And our Color Pro from ViewSonic here has a couple of really cool features I haven't mentioned yet. So one is that with the plugin, it'll actually automatically pivot if you're the kind of person who frequently has to switch between landscape and portrait, like say if you're uh, uh, developing graphics for web or whatever the case may be. And it also has a built-in ambient light sensor. And because the luminosity and the chromaticity are different, it won't affect the color accuracy of the image if the lights in your office change. And this can help reduce eye strain during marathon editing sessions. Once again, huge shout out to ViewSonic for sponsoring this video. Check out the links in the description below for more info and where you can pick up a Color Pro display for yourself. We've even got a discount code. If you pick one up, by the way, you should totally watch our review of the Blackmagic Pocket 4K camera. This is pretty much the camera to get if you want to shoot cinematic type content and you're on a tight budget. So it fits in pretty darn well with the video we shot today. So thanks for watching, guys. See ya.